want to talk about germline testing, kind of an update. You know, I've been giving t uh, varieties of this talk at this conference for years, and, and, you know, to be honest, when I first started giving it, most people in the room said, I can't do that in my clinic. I'm not going to do it now. I think most people are doing it, right? I mean, we've absolutely seen a sea change and things have shifted. So now it's about where to next and how do we keep going with this. Here's the current landscape, right? And, you know, we always talk about the, uh, you know, the iceberg, right? There, there's a handful of genes that we're very comfortable with saying they're important. Of course, uh, you know, BRCA1, 2, PAL, B2, et cetera. But of course, you know, 20,500 genes, we know that, that patients have uh, aberrations across many genes in cancer. So what is the importance of the rest of them? That's what we don't know. But regardless, somewhere between 5 and 15% of prostate cancers will have a hereditary uh, attribution or at least con contribution to the disease process. And the frequency of these aberrations definitely varies with the stage or state of disease. Uh, in localized prostate cancer, right, as you uh, upgrade from low risk to intermediate to high and very high, the uh, frequency goes up. As you can see here in metastatic, it goes up even further. And, you know, this is probably just about purification, right, of, of you get smaller and smaller groups. Certainly, if a patient has a germline aberration, pathogenic germline aberration, they're more likely to end up with bad disease, and we'll look at some of the data. The problem in the field is this. This is a summary slide looking at all the different groups, AUA, NCCN, ASCO, Philadelphia consensus, who should get tested, right, ASTRO, and it, it's all over the place. There's a variety of different guidelines, a variety of different factors. Some are considered important by some groups and not others. Which one do you follow? This can get confusing. I think we can simplify, though. So current guidelines, if, if you just summarize them together for lower intermediate risk, mostly the guidelines would agree that if you have a family history uh, of prostate cancer, uh, of a variety of, of cancers, but especially prostate, if you have a personal history of breast cancer, it's recommended that you get tested. And then there's the factors where you'd say it may be considered, so uh, atypical histology, introductory or crib reform, or a personal history of the other cancers which may be associated with the, uh, with the familial syndromes relevant to prostate. Okay, this is, this is generally where, where the groups would stand. But we had this data set. So Neil Shore, right, our friend, led this study where every man had germline testing, and they asked the question right off the bat, how many of these men would meet NCCN criteria for testing versus not? So that's the in criteria group versus the out of criteria group. And then they asked, what is the prevalence of, of pathogenic germline variants in these patients? 65% of these patients had lower intermediate risk cancer, right? This is not the very high risk group. And what you end up seeing here, right, they have almost 1,000 patients, almost equally split between in criteria and out of criteria. The Overall pre prevalence of pathogenic variants is almost the same, okay? So when you have criteria, criteria ought to enrich for the population you're looking for. That's the point of the criteria. Say, if, if you follow these criteria, you're more likely to find what you're looking for. But in fact, this data set of 1,000 patients said criteria don't matter. Whether they meet criteria or not, the overall prevalence is about the same. So that begs the question, why would you use criteria to decide who you're going to test or not, right? You should either be testing all of the patients or none of them, and you could decide whether, you know, 6 to 9% to is enough to bother testing, but it certainly is hard to defend the NCCN criteria as the basis of deciding whether you're going to test or not. All right. Um, this, uh, this a publication by Dr. Durst, uh, Darst, who was at USC, now she's at uh, University of Washington, uh, included men, mostly European ancestry, not, not a lot of uh, non-Europeans, 18 international studies, and it asks the question, what impact does this pathogenic variance have on the likelihood of developing deadly disease? So they had 686 men who started with low risk, prostate cancer, non-aggressive prostate cancer, but later went on 
to die of their cancer, right? And this goes into all those conversations about, you know, should we call, you know, Gleason 6 cancer or not? Some of these men still die, right? 4,100, little over men, who didn't die of their prostate cancer and asked, is being a pathogenic carrier relevant to the likelihood of dying of cancer for these low-risk men? And the answer was yes. For the men who had pathogenic variants in the 11 kind of recognized high-risk genes, the likelihood of ultimately developing deadly prostate cancer was double in men in low or intermediate risk disease. So this is why you might say, look, it's important to know if my man with low or intermediate risk cancer has a pathogenic variant. And then, of course, active surveillance, right? What do we do in active surveillance as a man is a carrier of a, of a germline aberration? So we have some data sets about this. The data is starting to come out. At least in this small series, they said, you know, the rate of, of uh, progression was relatively low. 20% of carriers progress, but, you know, of course, we're talking about 18 patients. Here's another uh, larger study. Um, that looked at uh, men with BRCA1, 2, or ATM. And you know, I think this study carries through a theme that we've seen elsewhere. When a man had BRCA2, the likelihood of progressing in active surveillance was far higher. No question about it, uh, that more likely to be upgraded. ATM didn't seem to have an impact. I, I think at this point, we could really start to say ATM is not a DDR gene. It's not a DNA damage response gene. It's something else entirely, right? It has more to do with sensing not DNA repair. Um, so this is, you know, this was a, a data from the Hopkins group and the North Shore group, but if a man has BRCA2, his likelihood of progressing is clearly higher, and how you're going to integrate that into treatment is perhaps a question for our panel later. How should that change uh, which men you're thinking about for active surveillance or how you might do their surveillance? Now, in the last couple of minutes, you know, we do have to talk about the, the uh, data problems as they apply to, to uh, different racial groups. Without question, the vast majority of patients in all of the databases uh, in any cancer for germline data and for somatic data are white Caucasians, and there is a paucity of data across all other groups, uh, maybe Ashkenazi Jews accepting just, uh, just because, of course, they've been studied extensively over the years. But, you know, this is your baseline for saying, all right, so in various groups, what is the likelihood of having positive germline variants? And you can say, look, it's, it's higher, highest, right, in the Ashkenazi Jewish and white populations. It's lower in other populations, perhaps. But you have to combine this data with other uh, reports we've seen that the rate of uh, variants of undetermined significance are far higher in the less represented groups probably because they just haven't been classified and studied, right? Undetermined significance. Well, if you haven't been studied, then a lot of what you have is undetermined. This is a study that looked at what about the frequency of testing, right? So you would say, right, that the frequency of testing and diagnosed patients should be about the same, and yet what you end up seeing consistently is, is underrepresentation in clinical care this, these tests aren't being recommended to men of African-American descent, uh, to, or African descent, men of Asian descent, you know, American Indians, basically zero. Okay, so we're not doing a good job of actually testing men uh, of non-Caucasian ancestry. And this carries through, unfortunately, to our clinical trials, right? I mean, you'll see that, that you know, black Americans um, are often tested other groups, you know, Hispanic, Latinos, almost not tested at all, right? So again, we have a data problem. And that's the end of my talk, 38 seconds. <laughs> Perfect.